At one time, teapots were the political bumper stickers of the day. And in this episode, we hear about one teapot in particular at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia and why this one-person teapot is called the cider pot, which is cool to begin with, but it gets better. Cider pots like this one at the time played a pivotal role in the American Revolution in that it helped to teach Americans how to protest. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. We're going to be speaking with the curator of collections at the Museum of the American Revolution, and that would be Mark Tudor, who you might also know has a blog called Pommel Cider. And I'll have a link in the show notes to that. And I'm really thrilled to like share this episode with you because it's such a cool story about the history of, well, people learning how to protest. And it does have a definite tie to Great Britain and what they were doing over there with the Cider Act and then what happened over here with the Stamp Act. And if that doesn't make sense to you at all, don't worry, because Mark has it under control after all. He works at the Museum of the American Revolution, which is a newish museum. They just celebrated their fifth year this April, which is super cool. And um, what a great guy. What a cool acquisition they have, this cider pot. It's a really neat story. So stay tuned for that because it's going to really inspire you a bit about our history and the connection with cider and the American Revolution. So we'll get to that shortly. But first... A wee bit of news from Out and About in Ciderville. This past week, I received my issue number 13 from Insider Japan. And if you don't know what Insider Japan is, well, it is Japan's first and only bilingual magazine dedicated to all things cider. And I love the cover. It's like a dark black ground, and there's two hands reaching out forward as if like it's jumping off the page. And of course, in the hands is... apples (laughs) they have small apples and large apples really really beautiful cover so you go lee reeve he is the editor and producer of this whole whole piece here insider japan and i was kind of cruising through and there i saw one of our sponsors fermentus and fermentus provides yeast solutions for cider makers and this was written, it's actually called Exploring the Diversity of Cider Profiles Through the Selection of New Yeast Strains. And it was written by a technical manager of fruit fermentation, and his name is Etienne Dorignat. And he goes through this whole piece on the robustness of a uh, yeast, uh, the analytical profile, the aromatic profile, and then talks about the four different yeast strains that they provide to cider makers, like myself. Or if you are a professional cider maker selling your beverages and you want to have consistency, well, Fermentus is the choice. And I see if they're in Insider Japan and they are helping to sponsor Cider Chat, you know that they are making a huge commitment to the cider trade and really upping their game. In fact, coming up in June, not too far away, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions directly to a tech at Fermentus because I'm going to be recording a podcast with them and delving into yeast. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to send an email my way to ask Fermentus, you can. Just send it to info at ciderchat.com. And I just got to mention, on page 12 of Insider Japan, is a piece on Cider Chat. In fact, episode 181 is featured. And that was with the makers at Little Pomona in the UK. And I was specifically talking about their ciders. We were drinking ciders. It was so much fun. And talking about Susanna's book called The Cider Insider. And that goes through 100 craft ciders to drink now. And 
that's evergreen. That's a book that you could get now, even if it's like five years old, you want to get it now because she knows her drinks. Believe me, I know she does. She's like well vetted in the drinks industry and she perused around and checked out different ciders. So if you're always kind of wondering like, which one to get tonight? Check it out. You can find it in the links to the show note. I'll put a link to it or just Google the cider insider. Insider is spelled I N S I D E R. That roar that you hear in the background right now, that is the sea coming back in to surround Mount St. Michel. Uh, I just, the feeling here is just amazing. I'm I'm in this, uh, really, it's dark out right now. The, <laughs> the rain came in, it's dried up. People are walking around with flashlights. It's that kind of slick pavement that you see on a spy movie. I'm looking up now at the Abbey, the top part of Mont St. Michel that is at that magnificent view where you see the, the parapets. I think they're called the little pointy things. And on the very top is a gold statue of St. Michael, all lit up at night. The history of this area, you could kind of feel it on the land here. You're standing on solid rock. I just don't even know how they built it. It's kind of like the Normans' own Great Wall of China, just rock walkways, some that kind of lead nowhere, stairways to nowhere. Uh, and stairways down to nowhere. They, maybe they walled it off to kind of control the crowds, but there's little nooks and crannies everywhere. And you feel the the age, the weight, the time that has passed through this place. It's just absolutely beautiful. And certainly one destination that I plan on bringing the next totally side of tour to Normandy and Brittany too. So I'm going to step away now and just bring you out so you can listen a little bit more to the sea coming in. There are waves coming in, and there's a specific thing about the waves that come into this particular spot. It just comes in like, like a flash wave. The force of nature, the force, the wonder of nature, it's so big. It's so much bigger than all of us. That audio clip was recorded in 2020 as I was forward-thinking about a totally cider tour going to Normandy and Bretagne. And I've had to wait two years now to offer this incredible tour to you. So this week, it is going live to both patrons and early subscribers to Cider Chat, meaning that if you send an email directly to info at Cider Chat, we will provide you the link. And next week, it will be going live to the public. This is a probably, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing this tour again, to tell you the truth. This might be my last tour to France. Now, I should explain that comment because it's not that I don't love leading Totally Cider Tours. And it's not that I won't be going to France. It's just that I have a whole bunch of other projects on my docket and I have to well, there's only so many Rias in the world. It's just one that I know looking at the mirror back at me. So this may be it, folks. And if you've been listening to this podcast for a while and have heard the other folks who have gone on this tour with me to France already, you know that it was really a trip of a lifetime. And this one's going to be that and even more. Because... Not only are we going to Normandy, we're going to Brittany too. So we leave from Paris, head out to Normandy, circle around there. It's a really chill pace. In total, we're visiting eight different makers, both in Normandy and Brittany. And yes, we stop at Mont St. Michel. In fact, that evening, we're going to have a dinner overlooking Mont St. Michel. So we get to watch the sunset over the Mont, which is... It's just one of those photo ops that just blows one's mind. And then we head down to St. Malo, which is in Brittany, circle around there, meet with some cider makers. We're staying right on the water. It's a stunning coastal city. And then head back into Donfronté to the Peri Peri region and then 
having what I call a Bordelais cider dinner at a Michelin star restaurant. Mm. I have a hunch that some out there in Ciderville might be thinking right now, well, you know, that, that cider tour sounds really cool, but I'm just going to go with my family or my mate. We're going to rent a car. We're going to tool about and set our own time schedule, which is true. You could absolutely do that. The difference between doing that and taking this tour is, well, the big one is you don't have to drive, which is a lovely thing because when you're going to all these different makers and they have a whole cacophony of products based on apples and pears from cider to perry to pomo to calvados, and you want to taste like the whole spectrum, you don't have to think about getting back in a car and driving. And I don't think I need to say more about that, but that's a beautiful thing. And not only that, you know, it's out in the country, it's a bit of a distance. So while we're on this luxury bus with our own dedicated lavatory, uh, a.k.a. Uh, el baño, uh, el to- toiletto, um, you know what I'm saying, you don't have to worry. I mean, there it is. You're okay. You're on the bus. You don't have to worry about finding little rest areas. Because believe me, when I have been out in the French countryside, it's not like there is little rest areas everywhere. They're actually kind of far and few in between, and it takes a while to kind of figure that out. But, you know, that's okay. You could do that. You know, we will survive. But on the bus, we do not have to worry about that. So we have a dedicated driver, which is lovely. We also have a full-on translator the whole time. So we can kind of dig into the different stories, the different techniques, and conversations with the makers who may or may not speak English, which is also something to consider when you're having your free evenings where you're able to have dinner on your own and just go at your own pace. On the Totally Cider Tour, those reservations can be made for you and recommendations can also be made. But I know that some travelers who like to go solo have no problem with spending the whole day driving, going to the tasting rooms, and then going back to the hotel and spending, you know, we've all done it, right? Spending that time on Yelp reviews and trying to figure out like, what's the distance? How are we going to get there? And then trying to figure out how to explain to the person who is probably not a native English speaker and making that reservation. And more often than not, we find out that it could be too late timing-wise because just the way that reservations are made in Europe. So that's up to you what to choose. But on this tour, all that will be taken care of for you, which allows you to really drop into your vacation and get filled up, get filled up with some time because we all deserve this after two years of watching those days pass us by. That was a hard one, wasn't it? Ooh, it just pains me to think about that. But um, hey, we're looking forward to happier times ahead and opportunity that just lands at our door step and taking it. So September 18th through the 24th, we meet up in Paris and sail away out to Normandy and Brittany. Come along with me on this Totally Cider Tour. If you want to have more info, send an email to info at ciderchat.com. Walking through the orchards. Up next, we're going to be speaking to Mark Tudor, the curator of collections at the Museum of the American Revolution, which is based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In this conversation, we're going to be having an eye towards what is taking place in the UK around about 1763 to 1766 and how cider makers there were really informing Americans or future American citizens, because remember, this is all pre the American Revolution, on how to stand up for your rights and how to get that done. So it was really key in an instrumental way for teaching skills that you and I might be taking for granted right now. You know, the how to protest, how to make your voice heard. But for early colonists, that wasn't necessarily a known factor. So just kind of bear that in mind. And learning two different pieces of legislation that really impacted people. One is the Cider Act, which was taking place in the UK. And then Uh, just a little bit later, the Stamp Act, which was going to be enforced here 
on the U.S. soil. Well, it wasn't the U.S. then. It was still a colony of Great Britain. And how these both interwove and how cider had such a big role in it. So make sure to grab a glass and, well, I guess if you want tea, that's fine. But my cup's going to be filled with cider. And join this chat with Mark Trudor, the creator of collections at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for having me, and, and on behalf of the museum, having the Museum of the American Revolution on the podcast. My role is curator of collections, which means that I've, I'm very focused on uh, researching, organizing, sharing our our core collection, so the things that the museum owns. So we actually have a, a what some people would call a permanent, but we call core gallery exhibition that covers the entire uh, American Revolution. And we define at the museum the American Revolution as the period from about 1760 to 1790. It's the whole period of the social, political, cultural change that goes on in America. And in the center of that is an eight and a half year war. So we're not just focused on the Revolutionary War, but the revolution itself. So my role is in part to write labels, talk about objects that really touch on everything from the end of the French and Indian War through the signing of the Constitution. Along with that, I'm, I'm really fortunate that I get to work pretty closely with our education department, helping both train our frontline staff, but occasionally I get to give programs as well and talk about the history, talk about objects, get people excited about the material culture that's left from the 18th century. Um, and we're fortunate to have a, a lot of pieces that speak to some of these moments uh, in a way that it, it's not they're, they're not generic items. It's not just a musket, but actually we know often the regiment, sometimes the company that that, red, that that musket was used in, and that helps us tell a very personal story. And that's that's one of the keys to what we do is we tell personal stories about the revolution that help explain the larger revolution. So it's not just this mass of people. It's not Washington and a faceless army. It's the individuals as much as we can. And we, we really are committed to telling a diverse story. So it is not just um, political leaders, it is not just authors, but we talk about how the revolution was impacted and, and influenced by people at all levels of society on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's get down with this uh, cider pot that the museum has now acquired. Let's first begin by describing it because I don't know if folks even know what we're talking. It's not an actual, a pot like a a little, you know, vessel in that way. Right. It's not a cooking pot, but it is a teapot. And it is very small. Um, We tend to think of teapots, you know, we tend to think of the ones you can pour for company uh, and they're quite large, but this one is actually very small. It's, it's maybe six inches across. Um, It was surprisingly how small it was when we, when we unpacked it, Um, but it's beautiful. It's delicate. Um, This one. And in fact, I'm only aware of one other no cider act teapot in existence, and it has a very similar decoration, but not the same. Um, so it has the same form, same same molded decoration, but the painting's a little different. Um, but it's it both of them still have their lids; they're both intact. Um, and this one says it, it's it, as I say, it's small. On one side, it says no cider act, and on the other side of it, when you turn around, it says apples at liberty which is a wonderful phrase. Um, it, if you didn't know about the CIDR Act, I think it would be a little confusing, but it's, you know, one of the things that kept coming out of the CIDR Act time period was um, they were sort of making fun of the taxation as we're taxing apples. And there's a good reason for that, because obviously it's led to the original sin of man. The sin of um, man. Can you say well, the first, the original sin, they ate right. the tree, the uh, apple from the tree of knowledge. So apples at liberty that you're just kind of pulling it off at liberty and, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. It's I it's a uh, there's really not a, a there's no one person who wrote and said, well, we're all going to say apples at liberty and here's why. Um, we wish that would happen, but you know it's job security for those of us doing research that they don't easily answer everything and we get to go spend time in archives <laughs> researching. Right. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out, but it's it's just this great. You know, kind of like today, you would have a mug with your political belief on it or in support of whatever cause that's going on. You know, here is a piece that a domestic piece, probably fairly inexpensive, that you could purchase 
put on your table to show your support for the protest against the CIDR Act. Let me get back to the image of it because this is, you know, we're in this mm. virtual space. So yep. we have a, a six inch teapot. It looks like a teapot, but it is not really a teapot. Or it, was it used as a teapot? It's a teapot. It's okay. so it's interesting that um, the the No CIDR Act statement is on a teapot, but it is, it's not because we're using that for cider. It's a teapot. And it's interesting because in this period, teaware is one of the most expressive sets of things that you can own. And whether it's showing your taste, uh, your, your good taste, whether it's showing your ability to afford a certain level of teaware, or in some cases, expressing political beliefs. And the Cider Act teapot is a good example of that. They're, they're not drinking warm cider, mold cider out of it. They're probably having tea, but Tea parties, tea in this period was often a social gathering. And that's where people, men and women, would discuss politics. And there's a maybe a quiet way to express your political belief. Mm -hmm. So even though this little teapot, and it, it's small enough that maybe it's even um, individual size, but you might still see it on a table during a social gathering. Mm -hmm. It's really meant to express a political belief, not necessarily your choice of beverage. So it's kind of like the bumper stickers of the of of history, right? A way it's to bumper stickers, T-shirts, yeah. modern coffee mugs. Right. I mean, we 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 still do this today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sure do. So the yeah. the teapot itself is white. It's like a an off white, like a. It's a cre yeah. It's cre it's cream colored. Cream colored. Um, and then the decoration is all done in red and black. And and the decoration is like a leaf motif in a way. Is that what you? How would you describe that historically? What is that? So it's it's got sort of a Rococo border all around it in red. And then the 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 No Cider Act and Apples at Liberty in black on it. And then there is there's a, a decorated strip that's in the teapot itself that separates the top and bottom halves. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's impressed into the clay and then painted on it are these red and black decorations. Mm -hmm. So all that's actually done by hand. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the, the top itself has this like little flute coming out of it. I'm calling it a flute, but what, what is that? It's actually a flower. A it's flower. You, you, okay. yeah. What's, what's on top of the lid. Yes. It's like a little, little open flower that you can then use as the handle to pick up the teeth, the lid, the lid itself. Yeah. And, and it has a lot of, uh, you know, texture to it, it in, in, in the pottery itself. The, the handle is, um, it looks like it's almost like woven. Yeah, the, the handles are, are made, and that one's a really beautiful one because it's two straps, really fine, delicate straps that they're both attached at the top of the, the pot. And then they're sort of woven around each other as they reach the bottom. And they're very delicate. And so it's kind of surprising that they've survived intact the way they have. Um, but they're really refined. It's, it's a really delicate piece overall. You know, today, a lot of our teapots are very thick and heavy. This one just feels very user-friendly. You can pick it up, but gently. Um, you're not going to do anything too quickly with it. So there's not a lot known about these teapots uh, all by itself. I mean, teapots are, are a very common ceramic production out of England. Uh, they're very popular as purchase items in England and America. You'll find that Americans of all social levels have teapots of some sort. But things like the Cider Act teapot, very little is known specifically about that as far as we couldn't say this particular potter is making it. What we know is it possible that they just applied the decoration to an existing pattern. They didn't necessarily make a new teapot pattern just for the Cider Act. Um, one of the nice things about one of the things that's handy about hand decorated items is you can really change that up as, as you need to. Um, so we do see teapots with political statements being produced. Mm -hmm. This one has a very short run from like 63 to probably 66 at most, 1763 to 1766. It's the statement, No Cider Act, that helps us understand why this particular pot was sold and who was interested in it. The, the acquisition of this came out of England. That I know of, no uh, Cider Act teapots were ever sold in America. In fact, the only thing I can, I've ever found that says no excise that's related to the Cider Act is a shoe buckle that came out of a Virginia plantation. Um, and that's the only material item I found so far referenced to the Cider Act. These teapots seem to have been pr made for in England for an English market. Mm -hmm. So the Cider Act was like 
like getting billboard in on the, all these like little <laughs> products all over the place. So maybe we should go there next because I know like listeners are like, what is a cider act? And it's not something that's really been talked about a lot. So I really welcome this opportunity. So the cider act is important as a, as an event for both England and America as Great Britain is coming out of the French and Indian war, what's also known as the seven years war. So at the end of that, Great Britain, who America was part of, we had come out as the victor. We had beaten France and Spain. Uh, America had almost doubled in size. We'd gotten Canada from the French uh, and a number of other territories. However, that meant that England was in debt quite a bit to the tune of, I think, of around 140 million pounds. And they needed to pay that off. And in America, we often go right to, well, that's the Stamp Act. England had to pay off its debts. They had, we owed them for whatever reason, they began taxing us. There's actually a few intermediate moments in there. And and the CIDR Act is one of them. We call it the CIDR Act. That's the shorthand for it. And the reason it's shorthand is the formal title is, and this is a wonderful title, an act for granting to his majesty several additional duties upon wines imported into this kingdom and certain duties upon all cider and perry. There's a reason we're calling it the Cider Act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, there's about 73 sections, articles to this, this act. And it does several things. It's not just about cider and perry. It actually establishes three lotteries, hoping that part of the proceeds will help pay off the debt. Um, it also taxes... And I love this. It taxes French wine, vinegar, and all imported cider. So anything coming into England is going to get increased taxing. And then they begin to place, not for the first time, by the way, there have been a few cider and perry taxes in England before, uh, but they begin to place new taxation, excise is called, on cider and perry production. Taxing all imported cider and perry. Now... Mm-hmm. The English are renowned for making a bucket load of cider and perry in, in sure. the world even now. So yeah. um, let's just talk about that just for a moment, because I don't think people realize that there was cider and perry being imported to to England at that time. What's What's interesting, and it's funny you say that, like we tend, I think, today to think if you have a, a regional, you excel at a regional product, you would never want anybody else's. Um, and I, especially now as, as American wine, American cider has, has improved so much in the last several years, the last several decades, mm-hmm. we still like our imports. There's still a cachet to having an imported drink. Um, even if you make something just like it, maybe you think, well, I'm going to serve the finer Normandy cider to my guests just to show that I can afford it. I can bring it in. Mm-hmm. Um, so importing this is still important. They still want in England, they still want to have access to French wine. French cider, French vinegar, um, even though there are, as you say, there are native industries for all of those mm-hmm. things. Okay, cool. Thanks for clarifying that. It's, it's a little strange because we, we, especially in this period, we tend to think everything's very local. Mm. But the 18th century, the world is very well connected through trade and people want to have imported goods, mm-hmm. um, which actually becomes important a little bit later with similar teapots here in America. So it's... Mm. You know, all the world is connected pretty well in this period. Maybe not. It's certainly not at our speed. It's certainly not at our level. But I can, I could easily be in Herefordshire and still want a good Normandy site. Yeah, cool. Okay, all right. A little sideways there, but uh, you were talking about the the taxation piece here. So England winds up needing to to pay for its its debts, and it, it's coming in at about 140 million pounds. They come up with this idea of taxing these imports, creating a lottery, and then taxing cider and perry. And they, they're hoping to raise about three and a half million pounds, which based on that 140 million doesn't seem like a lot, but it's helping the shortfall between what they know they have and what they need. And they do this because, again, as, as I said, they they have established, we've already been taxing cider, we're just changing it. They're not just changing it, though, and it's actually... Uh, probably more invasive than anybody expected it would be. Parliament thought, well, because we're just changing it a little bit, it won't, no one will have a problem. It'll be fine. But what they do in the CIDR Act, and this is developed in 1762, voted on, and by March of 1763, 
it it becomes law and it's announced in publications. And there quickly becomes, just as, as we've seen with uh, slighter legislation in America recently, where you know something's coming, you hear what it's probably going to do, and it takes a little bit to actually read the law to figure it out. There's there's a little bit of gossip ahead of the announcement of the CIDER Act, and no one's happy with it. In fact, even before it passes, there are people saying, this is not a good idea. And the reason they're saying this is the CIDER Act does several things that previous taxes had never done. First, it says that if you're going to make CIDER, you're going to pay a four shilling tax on every hogshead of cider you make. So a hogshead in this period is about 63 gallons. So if you make a hogshead of cider, you make two, you're paying four shillings per hogshead. That doesn't seem so bad. However, you also have to write to the excise office 10 days ahead of when you're going to make cider and say, I'm going to make cider on this date with this equipment. And I'm going to let you know where I'm going to store it once I've made it it gets better. If you don't own the cider equipment, I have to put in writing that I'm going to go borrow or or lease somebody else's equipment. That person who owns that equipment has to write in as well and say, I will lend or lease my equipment to this person. So on both sides of that, they have to write to the excise office and then receive written permission from the office that they can do that. None of this, by the way, none of the tax covers sales. It's all about production. So it's kind of like prohibition where it's not about consumption. It's about production and transportation. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, you know, what we think of as the most important thing is not what the tax was focused on. But along with all this, what they're saying, what they also say, if you are a poorer family and you only make cider or perry for your own use, then you pay Uh, I believe it's five shillings per person in the household who is eight years old or older. Now, a household does not mean mom, dad, and the kids. It could mean mom, dad, the kids, servants, extended family, anyone living in the household, you are paying that tax. So if you're a working family and you're not selling your cider, you now have to pay for every person who just lives in your household just because you might have a few trees and make some cider for your own use. If you choose to, if you're one of those families and you choose to sell the cider at any level, you have to apply in writing to get permission to sell a set amount of cider. And, and this all takes effect on July 5th, 1763. The order, the, the act takes effect on that date. They say, Please send in an inventory of all the cider you have on hand prior to July 5th, 1763, and that will be tax free. So for the first one of the first times, the government is saying, send us everything you have in your house. Wow. Wow. And and then along with that, you can't. The the final thing I think that's important for the, the cider piece of the act is you can't even transport cider again. Not for sale. It's not about sale. But if I give to you six gallons or more of cider, I have to apply in writing to move that that amount of cider. And then I have to receive permission in writing to do it. So you couldn't come over to the house one day and say, I'm having a little shindig. Could I get a barrel of cider? Sure, I'll bring it over. Like that's never going to happen again. You have to apply to the excise office. So solely England, or is this also taxing the col- colonists at this point like that too? This is all Great Britain. So okay. this does cover Scotland. It covers... But it does not cover America. The CIDER Act does not reach to America, so which is an important piece because Mm -hmm. this is, again, for them, it's a local tax. They think this is how we're handling it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because we tend to think that Parliament went right to Americans to tax Mm -hmm. to pay off the the Seven Years' War debts. But they actually started with Englishmen. There's a second piece to this that's important. It's going to sound very familiar. Excisemen, the people who are appointed to enforce the tax and all of those rules, they are given very broad powers. They're allowed to show up at your house anytime during daylight. And it actually says daylight and they can show up unannounced and they are allowed to search your home, cellars, outbuildings. If you have a warehouse, any building, they're allowed to search it looking for cider that hasn't been taxed. And they're basically given the power of judge and jury. 
they can, if they find something, they can write it up and they're immune from any kind of prosecution of wrongdoing under this act. Whatever they say goes. That's terrifying. I could, I, I could almost feel it's almost palpable what was taking place in these households when they were starting to yeah. actually understand what was going on and the fury yeah. that must have just been kicking up. I mean, it gets me angry thinking about it so many years ago, but oh yeah, wow. this sparks all of these protests, and this is how we get to the the No Cider Act slogan mm-hmm. that people. Not only in the cider counties, I mean, this actually the Lord Mayor of London is writing Parliament saying this is an abridgment of constitutional rights. How can you do this? You know, the idea of every a man's home is his castle comes out of these kinds of arguments in England. And are, it actually comes out of an earlier no excise argument from the 1730s that's readopted during the Cider Act time period. And we have members of Parliament saying you can't do this. It's taxing the poor. You're abridging people's rights. Right. Um, you know. It this sounds familiar to us, but it's not happening here. It's just a few years earlier in England. So then the roller coaster started taking place because of this. Uh, yeah. What what happened next in the the history and, and its impact on the American Revolution? So as soon as the law is passed, protests begin, and, th- and some of the protests are pretty, as we would expect, violent. You know, there there are mobs. There are people out in the streets, out in the fields. There are people trying to keep excise men away from their homes. And at a, at a political level, the next two years, so through the rest of 1763 into 1764, um, there are people trying to amend or repeal the Cider Act. And with no success, there, it's no one is changing it. It did cost the, the prime minister of England his role in 1763. But beyond that change, the next administration continued the Cider Act And it was in place for three years. Now, in that time, Americans are getting news of this. They're reading about it in the newspaper. And we haven't yet really had a reason to protest. We're just sort of observing from a distance. But we're seeing signs that maybe this could happen here. As the Stamp Act is announced, the the Stamp Act is is actually a tax on paper documents and certain goods. So basically anything official, uh, legal and court documents, religious documents, wills and probates, uh, bills of lading and shipping documents, liquor and wine retail licenses, uh, political and military commissions, land surveys, land sales. No, anything that comes with formal documentation was taxed under the Stamp Act. My two favorite things that are taxed are cards and dice. Hmm. So literally under the Stamp Act, there isn't a social level, there isn't a role that you might have that isn't affected by the Stamp Act. And for the first time, the government seems to literally be, the parliament seems to be in every aspect of American life in a way that it never was before. You know, I can't even play a game of hazard with the dice without having to pay the the Stamp Act duties. That That's outrageous. The Cider Act came into place on July 5th, 1763. The Stamp Correct. Act It's supposed to take effect later in 1765. It actually is repealed before it takes effect because the American protests are so great. And and I should say one of the reasons that Americans are protesting as well, and this will sound familiar after the Slater Act, is if you were caught breaking the, the Stamp Act law, you would be taken, you could be taken to court. And it wasn't just your local court. Americans were used to, if something happens, I'm going to be brought in front of a local magistrate and a jury of my peers, essentially. Well, England was very concerned, Parliament was very concerned that there would be too much local influence. And maybe the people judging the case were your friend and they would be too lenient on you or they let people get away with breaking the Stamp Act. So they decided the only way to be fair about this was to haul everyone in front of an admiralty court. And the only admiralty court they sort of identified and they thought was close, but not hard to get to, was the admiralty court in Halifax, Nova Scotia. <laughs> oh Clearly, they didn't have a map, right? Like, wow. if you're in Georgia. Oh my Politicians. That's all yeah. I can say. Politicians. Oh, boy. Oh. So, it's, so if you break the Stamp Act, you wind up getting hauled from home up to Canada and then back again. Um, you know, you could be. Total disconnect on, on all fronts. It seems that way, right? Yeah. yeah. 
And, and they were entirely surprised when both the CITER Act and the Stamp Act got so much protest. Because again, they thought, well, we've, you've done this before. It's not a problem. What's happening in that space is as the Stamp Act is being announced and Americans are hearing what this could mean, they have been reading the CITER Act news about the protests, the slogans. Um, they're learning more and more about it and they're taking notes. And they realize, hey, here is the model for us, how to protest. And they're very clearly taking it from what they're reading in the newspapers. And you start to see some of the same slogans. You start to see some of the same kinds of protests. Um, you start to see officials being hung in effigy. They did that. And that means, you know, a mock-up of them, not their actual person, is being hung mm -hmm. publicly for display during a protest. Mm -hmm. They're doing that in England during the CIDER Act. They're doing that in America during the Stamp Act. Um, our contribution to this in some ways is the Liberty tree where, you know, you would go and lanterns are hanging in the tree and that's, that's a gathering place for protests. And you see that the first one sprouts in Boston, you start to see it up and down the, the East coast, actually in, in the cider countries, they do it in apple trees, which is very fitting. They start to adopt all of that same practice and push back in the same way. Uh, and actually the stamp act protests are perhaps more successful. The Stamp Act paper did arrive in America, and some of the people who were responsible for overseeing the Stamp Act were, were identified. They, had, they were beginning to establish their offices. But protesters in America either confiscated or burned the paper. They attacked those individuals, sometimes those individuals and their homes. Um, you know, they made it very clear this was, these people were not going to be allowed to do their job. This news reached Parliament, and Parliament actually, before it rescinded the CITER Act, rescinded the Stamp Act. And then a few weeks later, the, the CITER Act was rescinded. Um, and it was replaced with, instead of taxing production and people at all levels, they're taxing specifically wholesalers and retailers. So if you're going to trade in CITER, whether it's directly to a consumer or to a tavern keeper, you'll be taxed. Tavern keepers are taxed, but you're not being taxed if you're just making cider for your own use. What was the, the fallout of that at that point, that they repealed the, the Stamp Act here in the colonies? And I keep on saying colonies because I just, you know, for folks listening out there, this was pre the actual start of the American Revolutionary War. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we were still a colony here. What was the, the sense about that? Was there like a sigh of relief or was it still like this curdling boil that was going on, you know, underneath the, the teapot saying, <laughs> yeah, we see this coming? Uh, in England, it seems to have calmed everything down. Okay. The protest seems to have gone through 1766 as they're repealing it. But the big years of the protest were 63 to 65. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, once, once the repeal came, everything seems to have calmed down. England spreads it out. Actually, at the same time they're taxing cider, they're taxing malt makers. So beer is part of this, but it's a separate act altogether. That doesn't get amended as much. The protests do rescind. They, they go away. They disappear there. America, the colonies here, and you're, you're right to say like we're still colonies. Often they're referred to as provinces in this period, um, but we're still colonies of Great Britain. The Parliament's response after the Stamp Act is repealed is to say, okay, we're not going to tax you, but we are asserting our right that parliament has a right to tax you. Mm. And Americans are not crazy about that either. In the past, parliament had taxed Americans, but actually taxed each of the colonies. The colonies would then tax their citizens, send money to England. And during the French and Indian War in particular, every colony was, was given a certain portion uh, of funds to raise to help the war effort. And then they would go through and whatever means they chose to, each colony would, would raise those funds, send them back to England or cover expenses. In America, as they're asserting, no, no, we, we have a right to do this, they then begin issuing other taxes as well. And those, as we know, as we go along, tax all manner of, of objects from daily life. They start, they're equally invasive in different kinds of ways. And in America during the Stamp Act crisis, this again might sound familiar. We begin purchasing items actually made in England that are helping us protest the Stamp Act. Oh. So there are no Stamp Act teapots made in Britain that are made for the Americans sent over here. We buy them and put them on our tables, just like the Cider Act protesters did in England. 
What, what does this teapot mean to the museum? Here's a moment where Americans are learning how to effectively protest, mm. how to get their concerns across to what they feel is an otherwise uncaring parliament. And the teapot, which you know, is, is how you is a communications device as much as it is a teapot. Mm. It is there to show you you being the guest to my home or even even other members of the family, you know, it's mm. the teapot is there to communicate to you that this is what I believe. This is where I stand. And, you know, it really helps us understand how Americans protested. It helps us see the roots of our own protest. And, you know, it's it's I would say it's an otherwise untold story. The teapot actually allows us the ability to tell the story about how we learn to protest effectively in a way that no other object I can think of does. Mm. You know, we tend to think of American protest as we just have always believed this. We were Americans were always on the path to independence, mm. but we weren't. When that teapot was created, as I said, we were very patriotically British. That teapot is the beginning of the change for us. Mm. That teapot is how we learned, okay, maybe we have some rights we need to protect and here's how we best do that. It's a, it's a really important piece for sort of the, the, the seeds, if you will, of our ultimate independence. It taught people how to stand up for their rights. This was a pivotal point, kind of like the Industrial Revolution, a change in the world of thinking about our place at home and in business. I, I'm really pleased you sort of keyed in on learning how to protest mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that we don't think about it. We think you just get a sign and a stick and you walk out into the street and that's a protest. Mm. But if you're going to do something effectively, it's more than just that. You're, you're, it's part of a much bigger plan. And taxation, whether it's CIDR or paper documents, you know, this is the, the one thing that really, I think, strikes at the heart of a lot of these arguments that we don't often think about. It's not just, I don't want to pay taxes. It's how is the tax fairly applied and fairly adjudicated so that if I do break the, the rules in whatever, whether I, whether I meant to or accidentally, or you just think I did and I didn't like, how do I defend myself as well? And we don't often think of CIDR being in the crosshairs of that, but it kind of, it was, it very much was. Both acts get at the heart of, yes, we need to tax to support our government, support certain things that we need in daily life, but how do we do it so that it's fair, so that it's not literally taking from people more than they can get? And how do we defend our personal rights when something happens? And the teapot, both that teapot and no stamp back teapots, those are quite literally the stars of those shows of, you know, here's, here's how people at all levels not only had that argument, but made a public statement. The teapot itself is a protest. Just putting that on your table is, I'm a protester, here's my protest right now. It's a charming piece. We are looking to crowdfund our acquisition of it. And we've actually set up a, a website for that, uh, that anybody can go to, all, all donations are tax deductible. Um, and the, the URL for that is support.mrevmuseum.com dot org forward slash cider and amrev museum which always trips people up is a m r e v m u s e u m all one word no spaces no dashes well, we'll make sure to have a link in the show notes to that so folks can follow great. up if they're not writing it down and i would say you know this is a really great piece of history to be supporting. So I want to really encourage folks out there in Ciderville to do so. What an amazing an acquisition. It touches my heart. I think just going back to that, like what this is about, I think it, over and over again, we see that it's the simple things in life. It's mm -hmm. about food. It's about quality. It's about drink that were so integral to our ancestors back then. And to not take that for granted, it's always about these basic rights to existence mm -hmm. that when come under pressure or inequality at any level, 
people will do the right thing to kind of stand up against that. And we can't take it for granted that people knew how to do that back then. We see these romanticized movies about the Rev- the American Revolution, and we think mm-hmm. they always knew how to do that. You know, you know, why can't I today? We're o- often like you know measuring ourselves against our ancestors in that way. And the truth is, we're always learning. And and I think what you're doing here at the the museum is just fantastic. And this is a great opportunity to to share this with school children, with your children, and in your taverns and at your cideries. Yeah. Please come visit us. I know I'm going to. I can't wait to come down and see that little pod <laughs> and to see everything else. And Philadelphia is a beautiful city to go to. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it is. Now, Mark, before we leave, I want to just touch in on what you do as a, a, a side piece here with your mm-hmm. own blog. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that, if we could, for a moment here. Sure. I actually have been researching historic cider for almost 30 years. Around about 2012, I was working at a historic farm and one of the farmers during our our harvest festival handed me gallons of fresh pressed juice and said, take it home. And and on the way home, I thought, I'm finally going to make cider. Uh, So I started doing that. I actually walked in the the front door. My wife looked at all the cider and said, what's that? And I said, I'm going to make hard cider. And she went, of course you are. Um, But that really was the beginning, sort of the blend of two things, uh, that, 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 that sudden cider and then my, my research interests. Uh, starting in 2011, I began recreate, researching and recreating 18th century ciders. Uh, and I share all of that on my blog, which is called Pommel Cider. Uh, cider, in this case, is spelled with a Y, so C-Y-D-E-R. Uh, and I try to, to share a little bit right now. It's about once a month I'm sharing something, uh, but really it's, it's about getting the word out about historic cider, American cider culture in particular. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is prohibition, how that's not what killed cider. Um, but I talk a little bit about everything from the details of making cider, how you rack it off in this period, all the way through things like the cider act, um, you know, I'm really interested in American cider culture, not just drinking it, although that's that's a fun part as well, <laughs> um, but bringing it full circle and really talking about who's making it, why are they doing it, what are they making, uh, and, and how are they doing it? Where, what are the influences? That's great. So, yeah, yeah, I really want to encourage folks to to subscribe to your, your blog because I, I always find an amazing resource. And you are a resource. So, Oh, thank you. I, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us on Cider Chat today. And, and the best of luck for everything that you're doing at the museum. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And let me know when you're coming to Philadelphia. If if the teapot is not already out on display, we'll make sure you see it. You know it. Big tip of the glass to both Mark Trudor and the Museum of the American Revolution. Now, there's going to be links in the show notes to both his blog and the crowdfunding page for this particular teapot that was newly acquired by the museum. It's kind of hard to find it at the actual website, so you want to go to ciderchat.com episode 317 to find that link where you'll be able to show your support for cider and its place during the American Revolution. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rio Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Cider, we like palms, we love orchards and having fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is, there is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is, there is a reason. 
We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms. We like orchards. Having some fun There is a reason There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we drink it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason We like walking through the orchards Dancing in the streets Smelling all the blossoms Kicking up our feet Oh yeah we like cider. Oh yes, we do. We like palms. Oh yes, we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We like cider, we like palms, oh yes we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!